Good evening to the saints of God. We are thankful that you all are here and we want to begin our lesson tonight. And before we begin our lesson, we'll have a word of prayer. And we, as many of you have noticed, uh, the questions, the pre-Bible study questions, as we call it, uh, have been on the screen since about 645. Just for your benefit, hopefully you have, you've had a chance to look at it. We'll spend a few minutes uh, going through each of those questions for clarity's sake. And you'll have uh, plenty of time to answer said questions as well. So at this time, just bow with me as we go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Then we'll give you time to write down those questions as well. Stand by. Let us pray. Gracious God, our Father, we're thankful for yet another day. We're thankful for life, health, and strength. And we pray, dear Father, as we assemble tonight to study your word, that we will be focused on our edification, being built up spiritually so that we may serve you acceptably. Forgive us of our sins. Bless the families that are here. Bless everyone uh, that seeks to please you. Father, you've been so good to us in spite of us. And it is our fervent prayer that we will just seek to do good by all humanity by spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ and just letting the love of Christ show in each and everything that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. As we look at the questions tonight, uh, there's five. And they will tie right into to our lesson. The questions will be answered throughout the lesson. I still want you to put your answers in the chat. We'll take a look at that at the end of our lesson tonight. A little bit of different, a different spin on it tonight. Question one, how many options did God provide for salvation? For salvation. Number two, what is the definition of a blessing? You know, it's a word that's used quite often, but I don't think people know what a blessing is. Uh, but we're going to find out tonight. What is the definition of a blessing? Uh, number three, can Christians be condemned? Two-part question here. Can Christians be condemned? And the second part of that, if yes, where is this found in Scripture? Don't just say yes. If yes, where is this found in Scripture? And there's a few places there. Uh, number Question number four, fill in the blanks. Neither is there blank in any other, for there is none other blank under blank given among blank, whereby we must be blank. And also you have the parentheses for the scripture. Put the scripture there for said verse. And question five of five, according to Revelation 14, 13, who are the blessed? Back to question two, if you will. Who are the blessed and what is their reward? Those are the five questions. Let me just take a look and see who's here tonight. Before we get started, good to see the familiar faces in there. You know, I'm doing some call outs here. Let me see what we got here. Hey, Joyce Davis, good to see you, sis. Uh, and let's see here. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get into our lesson tonight. Hopefully, everyone's had an opportunity to write down those questions. Uh, and because we will go ahead and jump into our lesson. I saw you too, Nisi. I want to make sure you knew I saw you. All right, here we go. Uh, our, our lesson tonight is What's in Christ? Brother Rick. Uh, from the pulpit on Sunday, did an excellent job in discussing fishing, uh, fishing for men. And when you talk about fishing for men in a spiritual context, uh, we're talking about evangelism. And I just thought it uh, fitting, thought it appropriate to just teach a lesson tonight that's a reminder. And the beauty of uh, the Zoom platform, some have heard this lesson. I mean, obviously, when it comes to scriptures and evangelism, it should not be new, but we can always reinforce a lesson Rick and I were taught by one of our mentors, uh, Brother Doris Pitts, uh, and in Oakland, California, God bless him. And as we think about uh, teaching uh, and fishing, uh, as, whether it's practically or spiritually, when you begin to fish, uh, you can always learn from someone that is more experienced. Uh, just listen to a preacher on Sunday, he was uh, not Saturday, if you will, and Sunday, uh, talking about uh, seeing his soon-to-be wife with fishing poles and uh, and she had that rag and she grabbed the towel and took the fish off and threw it in a bucket and went to the next one. Somebody showed her that. Uh, and so it is tonight we want to equip all the saints by just reinforcing of what it means to teach the gospel. So the key word, what's in, all caps, what's in Christ. Acts chapter four, beginning at verse number 10, as we get into our lesson tonight, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ, that means by the authority 
of Jesus Christ. Whenever you see by the name of, it's by the authority of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucify, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand, before, stand here before you hold. Here it is. This is the stone, Jesus Christ. This is the stone which was set at naught. Naught means nothing. You rejected him. He meant nothing. He had no value in your eyes. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. So the one you rejected, the one you crucified, it's by his authority. <laughs> it's by his authority that this man not only was healed, it wasn't because of Peter and John, it's by the authority, by the power of Jesus Christ, who you rejected, who has become the head of the corner. If you build something from a construction standpoint, you have a, a, a cornerstone, a, a foundation is built. And now Jesus is referred to as that chief cornerstone. The church of Christ is built, was founded by Jesus Christ. And so verse 12 is our key verse tonight. Acts chapter four, here it is. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. And so as we look at the lesson, what's in Christ? If you have some paper tonight, uh, some notebook paper, copy paper, whatever, put a line down the middle, put in on one side, put in on the left side, put out on the right side as I have it on the screen. I'll give you 10 seconds or so to do that, or you can just, just write it down on whatever you have, uh, because it will help you uh, really understand the contrast, that word contrast, and when you think about that from an English standpoint, when you contrast hot and cold, when you contrast light and dark, there's a distinct difference. And what we must understand as children of God, as we teach the word of God, is there's a distinct difference being in Christ and out of Christ. So according to Acts chapter four, here's the pattern. According to Acts chapter four and verse number 12 that we just read, what's in Christ? Salvation is only, only in Christ. As we've said before, I'll say again, you can buy groceries at, uh, here in Florida. I was about to say Kroger and A&P, but y'all don't know what that, those stores are. That's an Ohio thing. But here in South Florida, in Miami, you can buy groceries at Publix, you can buy groceries at Winn-Dixie, you can buy groceries at Walmart, Aldi, Albert, all these other stores around here. You have a lot of choices, but when it comes to salvation, salvation's only in Christ. So if salvation's only in Christ, out of Christ, there is no salvation. That's a contrast, folks. And I want you to understand, if you want to be saved, you must be in Christ, because out of Christ, there is no salvation. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter one and beginning at verse three. Ephesians chapter one. We're gonna do some Bible study old school tonight. I'll aid you a little bit with some things on the screen, but I need you to have your Bible or your phone, however you can access it the quickest, because I need to go through this in haste, uh, with a little bit of haste so that we don't uh, go over our time tonight. In Ephesians chapter four, uh, chapter one, excuse me, beginning at verse number three, the Bible says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So now the Bible lets us know that all spiritual blessings, that he has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Verse seven, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So what's in Christ according to Ephesians 1, verse three and seven? All, every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing is in Christ Jesus. So as we think about that for a minute, uh, if all spiritual blessings are in Christ, then we need to recognize there's nothing out of Christ. No spiritual blessing. And I know I did ask the question uh, earlier. And as I said, if you pay attention to the lesson, all the questions that we asked in the, in the pre-class uh, or pre-study uh, slide will be answered through the class. A blessing can be defined as a gift or a benefit or a reward. Uh, and so if all spiritual benefits, blessings are in Christ, outside of Christ, there are no spiritual blessings. And just to be clear, what are those spiritual blessings? In verse seven of Ephesians chapter one, the Bible lets us know specifically what those spiritual blessings are. Look at verse seven again. 
in whom, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood. The redeemed are in Christ. There is no redemption outside of Christ. Why is that? Because we're, we are redeemed through his blood. And you come into contact with his blood when you are baptized in the watery grave of baptism. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. So what are some spiritual blessings? Put it in your notes. Forgiveness of our sins. Redemption through his blood. So I hope you see the contrast. It, salvation's only in Christ. No salvation out of Christ. All, every spiritual blessing in Christ. No spiritual blessings outside of Christ. Let me do a temperature check very quickly. Let me do a quick temperature check. If you follow me, go ahead and let me know in the chat. Give me an amen in that chat if you all follow me. Everybody good? Amen, Thomas. All right, that's what I want, that's what I want to see. Good job, Alexis. Good job, baby girl. All right, Paris, I see you. Okay, let's keep, let's continue. Thank you all for following. So as you see this, this format, and this is easy for you to teach. This is more of a train the trainer tonight. You can sit down with somebody, have them open their Bible, read it for themselves, but then they make the contrast. Because you don't need to have a PhD in theology to see in and out tonight. Speaking of which, let's go to Romans 8 and 1. Turn your Bibles over there. You may already be there. Let me get there. Romans chapter 8 and the verse is number 1. Romans chapter 8 and the verse is number 1. Or you can just take this recording from tonight and just play it for somebody and send it to them. Romans 8 and the verse is 1. The Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Now, some of your translations, namely the New International Version, NIV, has that footnoted. It just says there's no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. You better be careful with that. Because if you just say there's no condemnation, if you're in Christ, that means once saved, always saved, which is false doctrine. So you need to understand there is no condemnation to those who live that are in Christ, step one, but you got to live by the word. Let me make that more practical. You don't just get baptized and say, okay, whew, I'm in Christ. I've been added to the church of Christ. Now I can go out and act a fool. That doesn't make any sense. You still have to live you must get in Christ. Why? That's where salvation is. Why? That's where all spiritual blessings are. And once you get in Christ, you, you are now a babe. You grow up, you mature, you develop, and you live according to the word of God. When you look at Romans 8 and verse 1, when the Bible says, there is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk, live, not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Living according to the flesh, do what you like. Live according to the spirit, you live according to the word of God. You live by the word of God. So if, if there's no condemnation to those in Christ who live according to the word of God, I wonder what's out of Christ. This is the only one you're gonna find where there's something outside of Christ. And there it is, condemnation. What does the word condemnation mean, class? It means destruction. Have you ever seen a building that's set to be destroyed? They mark it. They say that building is condemned. Put the red tape around it. Most of the time it's red tape because it's set for destruction. That building cannot be occupied. And I find that very interesting spiritually because if you don't have the Holy Spirit inside of you, not dwelling in you, your building, your tent, our body is not occupied spiritually and if we don't do something about it before we die we are in essence red taped and i'm not talking bureaucracy i'm talking spiritually i'm talking theology so that red tape we're set to be spiritually destroyed desolate without the holy spirit amen saints you got a little fishing you got a little construction in all of that particular verse so remember romans 8 and 1 saints of god can be condemned if they fail to live according to the word of God. And sadly, too many Christians, those who have been baptized into Christ have fallen away and they're living according to the world's devices. And we gotta be careful. Moving right along. Hope y'all doing all right. Let's go to 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. If you, if you don't have uh, the paper, just write down these scriptures in this sequential order. Just write them down. It'll help you as you sit down and study for yourself. 
every child of God needs to be able to walk somebody through the plan of salvation. What's in Christ is our question on the floor tonight. Second Corinthians chapter five and the verses 17. Second Corinthians five and verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so the Bible lets us know that in Christ, there are new creatures. Now that new creature, that's a new spiritual creation. What do you mean by that, brother? New spiritual creation. You still the same height physically, the same weight spirit physically, excuse me, but spiritually you have a clean slate. You are a babe in Christ. God has forgiven your sins. Back to spiritual blessings. Your sins are forgiven. You are now redeemed by the great redeemer, Jesus Christ. You belong to Christ. That's what Christian means. And as, in, as a new creature, you walk, you live according to the word of God. You see how all that just kind of tied it all together that we just talked about? You're saved. You receive the spiritual blessings. You're, you are, so long as you live according to the word of God, there will be no con condemnation because you are a new creature. Now, outside of Christ, our new creatures, you still got the old man of sin. And I've shared this many times from pulpits, not only in Miami Gardens, but throughout the land. I've heard Christians say, you keep messing with me, the old man gonna come out. What you mean, oh, I thought he was crucified. I'm talking about the old, hey, Lindsay, you gonna, I'm, I'm just using Lindsay as an example. He had, Lindsay's never said this. Uh, at least I haven't heard him say it. <laughs> or, or Rick, I'm using Rick and Lindsay's examples because they're good examples of not doing this. Uh, and you know, I've heard people say, yeah, you keep messing with me, that old man gonna come out. See, that's foolish talk. Because the old man is crucified. The old man, the, the sin, when you know you mess with me, I mess with you. You hit me, I hit you, hit me once, I hit you three times. Dude, that's foolishness, eye for an eye. And so we can't live that way. That's outside of Christ. That's worldly thinking. And so it is tonight. What's in Christ? New creatures, new spiritual creation. We're, that's what we, why we call it being born again. We don't enter a second time into our mother's womb. We're spiritually born anew. And so as we look at Hebrews 9, and go on that turn over there, and as we all know, we have dealt with so much loss recently in our congregation and, and throughout this world. When you have a death toll due to the pandemic uh, on the screen, and I don't see it on the screen as much now, but it's still referred to, I, mean, I think half a million people in the midst of a global pandemic. We're living through some historic time, unprecedented time. And the Bible says in Hebrews 9 and verse 27, as, as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. So we know there's an appointment for physical death. And I want you to understand, Christians die physically and non-Christians die physically. There is no distinction there. Death does not discriminate. But the Bible tells us something in 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. Let's turn over there, please. 2 Peter 3 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 3, and the verse is 9. And the Bible says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Some key words there, class. The Bible says God is not slack concerning his promise. So you can count on God to deliver, unlike man. Man will let you down. I wonder if anyone's ever heard of somebody breaking a promise. If you haven't, keep living. But see, God's not that way. That's what Peter is saying. First of all, you can trust God. You can have faith in God. But he goes on to say that God is not willing that any should perish. That word perish means die. But the Bible just said in Hebrews 9 and 27 that it is appointed unto man once to die physically. Physically. In 2 Peter 3 and 9, we're talking about spiritual death spiritual separation. We're talking about spiritual condemnation. And so to break this down even further, the Bible lets us know that all would die physically, but God's not willing that any should perish spiritually. And you might make sure you put on there in your notes. I should have put spiritually on that slide on the left side there, but that should be God's not willing that any should perish spiritually. That is not a biblical contradiction. One deals with the physical and one deals with the spiritual. And outside of Christ, you have a double, you have a double whammy. 
you die physically. We all will die physically. But there's also spiritual separation from God. That is condemnation defined. Depart from me. I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. When Jesus said that in Matthew 7, there's your condemnation. Depart from me. Get away from me. I never knew you, ye workers of iniquity. When you think about that, that's, that's heavy duty. And not only is it um, a, a condemnation, but it really speaks to just the sad commentary. Matthew 7 and verse 23 is what I was quoting. And then what Jesus says, and look at verse 20, Matthew 7. I want to give you this bonus scripture. Matthew 7, 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my father, which is in heaven. There's something we must do. Jesus says in Matthew 7 and verse 22, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils. In other words, by your authority, we cast out devils. By your authority, we've taught. We, but we said in Jesus' name, isn't that enough? In your name, we've done many wonderful works. There are folks that are standing on street corners, passing out food, going to prisons, doing all kinds of wonderful works, but they're not in Christ. Don't let works take the place of obedience. Now, obey with works. Now you're talking. Obey God and do good works. Now you're talking. And then will I profess unto them, verse 23 of Matthew 7, depart from me. I never knew you, you workers, you that work iniquity. God's not playing. You're either in Christ or you're out. And so having said that, you can put Matthew 7 in your notes, 21 through 23 is a bonus scripture. I didn't put that on the slide, but it certainly fits like a glove. So in, in Christ, new creatures. Out of Christ, old man is sin. In Christ, in Christ, all will die physically, but God's not willing that we or anybody die spiritually. Outside of Christ, physical and spiritual death. Speaking of death, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 13, go to the back of the book. Go to the last book in the Bible class. Revelation chapter 14 and the verses 13. Revelation 14 and verse 13. The Bible says, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, say at the spirit that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. So based on Revelation 14 and verse 13, what's in Christ? It is a blessing to die in the Lord because what awaits uh, those who die in the Lord faithfully? Eternal rest. That's why we celebrate in homegoing services we celebrate the life of, the, of those who died faithfully in Christ. It's a tough thing, and I've had to do it too many times. When you eulogize someone who hasn't been faithful, all you can say is they're in the hands of a just God. I can't put anybody in heaven. I can't send anybody to hell. I don't have that authority. But the, the eulogy is different. If you pay close attention, it is different. You go from general, and when you have those faithful soldiers in Christ, like a Jack Smith and a sister Barbara Baker, it's a different eulogy because you, you can cut in there because you know how they live. And all I'm saying to you tonight, insert your name as a faithful member of the Lord's church. It's great that you're here in Bible class tonight. Let's walk the walk and talk the talk. So in Christ, it's a blessing to die in the Lord. Eternal rest awaits. Outside of Christ, where there's condemnation, where there's the old man of sin, no spiritual benefits, no spiritual blessings, no salvation. So if you're not saved, what do you expect for eternity? Rest, eternal rest. Be careful with the RIP. The RIP, rest in peace. So you can't rest in peace unless you're in Christ. That's not a threat. That's Bible. That's basic fundamental teaching. So what's in Christ? eternal rest for those who died in the Lord faithfully. Outside of Christ, no rest, torment, and as you heard earlier, Romans 8 and 1, condemnation. You see how it all works together? 
This is, this is deep theology, but the Bible is so plain. There's no gray area. It makes it very easy for us to see what we must do in order to please God. As we hasten on, you see, you've seen what's in Christ. You've clearly seen what's out of Christ. So let me go ahead and ask the question to the class. Do you want to be in or out? There's only two options here. It's going to be, you want to be in or out? Go ahead and talk to me in the chat. You want to be in or out? Good. I hope and pray nobody put out. God knows. I hope, I hope so. Come on. Amen. Because you have, now, if, if you noticed, and I appreciate you all responding, because uh, when you think about it, there's what's, there's nothing out there for us. There's a song we used to sing growing up. Uh, where could I go? Living below in this old sinful world, hardly a comfort can afford, striving alone to face temptation sore. Tell me now, where could I go? Right on point, Paris, but to the Lord. And so when you, so when people say, I, I'm leaving the church, where are you going? The devil's like, come on over here, baby. Yeah, you can be, yeah, those old mean people in the church. The devil wants you to be mad. The devil wants you to leave. The devil wants you to just focus on yourself. Nobody understands you but me. The devil's saying, you just be, you be you. <laughs> Better be careful too. So how do you get into Christ? Thank you for responding in the chat. What well, the Bible lets us know. In Galatians chapter three and verse 27, we are baptized into Christ. We are baptized into Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. How do you get, and so you can't have Christ without his church because the Bible lets us know in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13 that we are baptized into one, not church of your choice. You're baptized into one body. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse number 13. The Bible lets us know that when we talk about one body, what is that body? How many bodies are there spiritually? Ephesians 4 and verse number 5, 4 and 5. The Bible says there is one body, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So that there's, if you're baptized into Christ and you're baptized into one body and there's only one body, then what is that one body? The Bible lets us know in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18 that the body is the church. Get this now. If the body is the church and there's only one body, you get into that one body by through baptism. You get into Christ through baptism. The saved are in the church. So if you haven't been baptized into Christ, you're not in his church. You can't have Christ without his church. And so Colossians 1 and 18 lets us know that the body, he is the head of the body, the church, It's his body, only one. And so in Ephesians chapter one, beginning in verse 22, the Bible lets us know that the church, conversely, the body is the church, but in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, the church is the body. And I love what Paul says in Ephesians chapter one, Ephesians, the first chapter, and Paul breaks it down uh, for us briefly. Let's turn over there, Ephesians one, because it brings it, it puts it all together. When Paul wrote to the church at Colossae talking about, and he's the head of the body of the church, that in all things he might have the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence, Christ is, a, in, is the priority on everything. But look at Paul. Listen to Paul in Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 22. And hath put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. So now who put what under whom? And hath put all things under his feet, Christ's feet, and gave him, Jesus Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, verse 23, which is his body. The church is the body, the fullness of him, Jesus Christ, that filleth all in all. If you want to really put that in context, you go back one more verse to 21, because it includes the father. In verse 21 of Ephesians chapter 1, the Bible says, Far above, all, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And so the Bible talks about how God worked this, his plan through Jesus Christ. So let me pause for a minute again and 
when we think about how one gets into the church, how one gets into Christ, it is through that mechanism, the mode of baptism. And it's not a sprinkling. It's not a pouring. Baptism is a burial in water. And now let me just pause for a minute because we got a few more minutes now. I actually got a little bit ahead of schedule and I love that. Let me ask you all this. When we talk about the mode of baptism, being baptized into Christ, where in scripture, I want you to put it in the chat, where in scripture can we find that baptism is a burial? I'm thinking of two specific books written by Paul. Where can we find that in scripture, class? Baptism is a burial. Romans 6, give me a verse. I like it. It's a correct book, correct chapter, give me a verse. Uh, I like that, Tony. That was good. Uh, good, Aldrich. There you go. Uh, Romans chapter 6, you can go 2 through 5, and specifically Romans 6, and it's about verse number 4. Let's turn over there. I want to make sure that those that may be visiting with us, and you're certainly our welcome guests, will recognize and see how plain the Bible is. In Romans 6, I was thinking about ex verse 4 specifically, because in Romans 6 and 4, for time's sake, therefore, we are buried with him by, bap by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up, from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So what Paul said in Romans 6 and 4, we are buried with him, fully immersed in water. Like when you bury something, you don't put a little dirt on it. That's not bury. You can still see. If you want to try to bury something, good, Corbin, you just hit it, brother. When you bury something, you, no, you got to, you put it on, you, it's fully immersed. We are fully immersed in water and we rise up to walk, to live in a brand new way of life. Excellent. Romans 6 and 4 is the answer specifically. And Andre Corbett, right on time, as I was reading another verse, is Colossians 2 and verse number 12. Now, saints, we need to have this in memory. Don't just tell somebody, baptism, you ain't, it ain't sprinkling. Give them a read. Give them Bible. Don't try to create some kind of uh, argument. It's not about that. Teach them. Colossians 2 and verse number 12, the Bible says, buried with him in baptism. There it is. Wherein also you are risen with him, through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. So the likeness we're talking about, when you get into Christ, we're baptized, immersed, buried in water, and we rise up to walk in a brand new way of life. And so as we think about that, that's a beautiful thing. Lisa James makes mention of in Acts chapter eight, an Ethiopian eunuch, when Philip came to him and said, uh, he's preached unto him Jesus, and he came to a water and he said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me from being baptized? Got a quote for time's sake. But then but Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you mayest. And what happened in Acts 8 and verse 38? He commanded, it to, he, he confessed, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And upon that confession of that Ethiopian eunuch, both he and Philip, the Bible says, they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he, Philip, baptized him, the eunuch. So it doesn't mention burial, but it mentions they went down into the water. So certainly when you look at Acts 8 and 38, Colossians 2 and 12, and Romans 6 and 4, you don't even have to infer anymore. It's called mating scriptures. Burial, both down into the water. Amen, saints. Y'all all right? Y'all doing all right tonight? Let me know you're okay. Just say amen one more time. Then we'll go ahead and wrap this up and go through our Bible questions for tonight. Everybody good? Amen, brother. Amen. All right. So let's go ahead and wrap this up. So we know what's in Christ. We've looked at how you get into Christ. And when you think about the benefits of being in Christ, the clarity of what's not in Christ, here's you can only get into Christ through baptism and reap those spiritual blessings. But what about the church? You cannot have Christ without his church. You cannot have Christ without his church. People say things like, well, God knows my heart. Yes, he does. But what does that have to do with you obeying God? That's like a child saying, well, mama knows my heart, but you haven't taken out the trash. Daddy knows my heart. <laughs> okay. I know how you've been trained. I know my expectations for you, but you still have, an you still have a job to do. And Brandon, if you're listening, don't try to have a trash on Friday. Well, daddy, you know my heart. Recycling bin hasn't been taken out. Trash hasn't been taken out, but you know my heart. That won't end well. <laughs> what I'm saying to each of you is you can't have Christ. You can't just try to put it on God. 
I'm still working on me. God's still working on me. You know, God gave you a plan. God gave us opportunity. And you can't have Christ without his church. In 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 27, the Bible lets us know that ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. Remember what the body is. I quoted the verse, 1 Corinthians 12 and 27. Look at it for yourself. Write it down. Ye are the body, the church of Christ, and members in particular. Remember what the body is. We just went through that in our last slide. The body is the church, Colossians 1 and 18, and the church is the body, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. So if we are the body, we are the church of Christ. How many bodies were there in Ephesians chapter 4? One body, one church. Amen. And in Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, salute one another with an holy kiss. The church is, plural, of Christ. Salute you. Now, when you see in Romans chapter 16, remember who's speaking, to whom they are speaking, and what they're speaking about. Paul, writing to the church of Christ located at Rome, one church, one universal body, but there's different congregations in different locales. Not different churches, but one body in different locations. Let me say that again. Not different churches, but one church of Christ, headed by Christ, chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ, purchased with the blood of Christ, Acts 20 and 28, but in different locations throughout the world. So when Paul says, salute one another with an holy kiss, in other words, greet one another with hospi hospitality, the churches of Christ salute you. You have the word church, the Greek word is ekklesia, which means a called out body. So you got it now? An assembly. So the saints assemble in Miami Gardens. The saints assemble in Dayton, Ohio. The saints assemble in Rome. And I'm, I'm not talking Vatican City. I'm talking about the Church of Christ. You have the one body universal and you have congregations of the church. There's no universal eldership where you go someplace and you have, well, okay, this eldership is over this area. That's foolishness of man. You got a district elder. No, sir, no, ma'am. Each congregation is autonomous. Each congregation has its own equipped, trained elders who qualify and who the congregation knows and respects. And the congregation has to follow the leadership because elders are accountable for preaching and teaching the word and making sure they watch out for the flock. One body, different locations. And so as we close tonight, let's take a look at our questions. Question one, how many options did God provide for salvation? How many options did God provide for salvation? The answer is only one. Now, where do we find that? And again, I kind of, uh, as we, oops, sorry, let me go back here. He only provided one. Let me go to the chat because I want to see what you all have here for your answers. And as we look at your answers, because I'll, I'll put them up on the screen for your benefit. Let's see what we have here. Let me see who took the time to answer questions. Darcy says only one option. I like that scripture too, Darcy. Let's see. Ty says only one. Uh-huh. Look into these other answers ahead. Very good, Ty. Looks like you're on point. Jeanette, good. All right. Those that die in the Lord may rest from their labors. Excellent, excellent. Let me see if anybody else took the time to answer. I only see three. Well, here's one more. And that was Jeanette. Derek, good job, Derek. Mission sent through the water baptism. Okay, we're going we're gonna to answer that, uh, young brother. And then Tony, very good. <laughs> all right, let me give you all the answers for these from the Bible. For those of you that didn't answer them in the chat, I hope you're following at home. How many options did God provide for salvation? Only one. We read Acts chapter four and verse 12. And what you will find is we answered each of them intentionally throughout the class. So you should be able to fill in the blanks. I'm going to jump to question four. Why? Because Acts 4 and 12 is the answer to question four. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. That is Acts chapter four and verse number 12. Just to be clear, what is the definition of a blessing? It's benefit a benefit. And we understand that benefit, another definition of blessing is a gift. You know, people talked about, uh, and Paul says, for by grace are you saved, it is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. 
So gift, benefit, reward, that's, that's the definition of a blessing. But I want you all to understand something about a blessing. There are physical benefits and spiritual benefits. If you work on a job and there are benefits, you may have benefits of health and medical or medical and dental, if you will. <clears throat> One benefit may be a 401k where the company contributes to whatever you put in it. That's a benefit that won't save you. Those are physical benefits, but spiritual benefits are only found in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3 and 7. Those spiritual benefits include forgiveness and redemption. You may have all the boats and houses you want. Uh, I had the pleasure this <laughs> today of having an interview with a billionaire, a guy that's on TV, people know who he is. Uh, and I had the pleasure of interviewing him for 30 minutes today. And he talked, and I was talking through talking to him about uh, doing his intro for a show that I was doing. And I mentioned 500 million. He said, excuse me, it's 550 million. I said, I'm sorry, don't want to short you $50 million. And it, he, he just laughed. But you can have all of that, but and still not be saved. And so what I'm saying to each of you is, be mindful of, don't get confused and don't let people confuse you because people, you ask people, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. Have you obeyed the gospel? It's kind of hard to be blessed spiritually if you haven't obeyed the gospel. Can Christians be condemned? The answer is absolutely yes. Romans 8 and 1, we read it in Romans 8 and 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So in Romans 8 and 1, the Bible is clear. We've already explained it. But just to put an icing on this, on this cake, Christians who do not walk after the spirit, but who choose to walk after the flesh can lose their soul. Christians can fall from grace. I want to say that's Galatians 5 and 4. Let's double check that. I want to make sure we give you uh, exactly what you need. But Christians can fall from grace grace. And I want you all to understand that. And that's Galatians 5 and 4 as a backup scripture for you as well. We've already answered question number four, Acts 4 and 12. And finally, and we're right on time, according to Revelation 14, 13, who are the blessed and what is their reward? Revelation 14, 13. And oftentimes, and many of you have heard me do this, many a gospel preacher has stood in a pulpit during a as they extend and deliver a eulogy. And it is a blessing, as we have done lately, for faithful members of the Lord's church to close in Revelation 14 and 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, write, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord. From henceforth, yea, saith the spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Who are the blessed? Those who die in the Lord. Let me put a caveat on that. Those who die in the Lord faithfully. What is their reward? What is their benefit? What is the blessing? What is the gift? Eternal rest. What's outside of Christ? Condemnation. And so it is tonight. If you're visiting with us, I hope, trust, and pray. Not only that you've understood the lesson, but that you are ready to answer the call. Jesus says, Behold, I send his door knock. So the invitation has been extended from the Lord Jesus as a gospel preacher, as a messenger tonight. I just ask you today, do you believe what the Bible says about what's in Christ? If so, why not obey the gospel? Hear and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. You must hear and believe the gospel. The gospel is the good news or glad tidings about what Jesus Christ did. He died, he was buried, he rose again the third day. If you believe that with all your heart, are you willing to repent, change your mind? Turn from your ways and turn to God. And, and once you turn from your ways and decide, you choose free will, you choose to follow God. Are you willing to confess Christ to be the son of God? Upon that confession, you're baptized, immersed in water, buried in water for the remission of your sins. Acts 22 and verse 16, baptism washes away our sins, a spiritual blessing, a spiritual benefit. You rise up to walk faithfully until death. And God has promised all who live faithfully in Christ Jesus a crown of life. It's 745. That concludes our lesson tonight. We're thankful to God that you all were here. We hope, trust, and pray that all of you were, many of you know these scriptures. In some cases, it may not, might not have been new at all. But I hope, trust, and pray that it reinforces what we all need to know 
and do, which is share the gospel of Jesus Christ.